What's good? My name is Chris Dallas. This is Trapping Anonymous. We are back. Thank you, first and foremost, for supporting the movement. The things that we got going forward and going on, it's just been amazing being a part of Breakbeat. You know, I'm eternally grateful for everybody that's still supporting me, been supporting me. Please continue to support. Um, do remember the stories that you hear. Uh, they do not necessarily reflect real life events. They are used to entertain, educate, or just keep your little homie off the streets. This, today we have uh, Bank Robber Anonymous, long awaited. I've been waiting a long time for this episode. And I just can't wait to see what and where we can take it. So with no further ado, my name is Chris Styles. This is Trapping Anonymous. Let's get it. Boy. Welcome home. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh man. Walk me through the first time you robbed a bank. I was 15. Wow. Yeah, I was 15. I was hustling prior and I didn't want to hustle more. So, you know, because I've always been more mature. So, one of the old heads said, Yo, yeah, we're going to PA, we're going to handle some things, cover us. Mm, all right. We drive around, literally gave me mass. Uh, it was a submachine gun, gave me a submachine gun, said all you gotta do is go in the bank and stay in there with the gun. I said, okay. In and out, probably less than two minutes. Less than two minutes? In and out. And that was sort of your inception into- mm -hmm. uh, Fast money. Fast money. Fast money. Fast forward me to the day you actually got caught. What, did, describe that day. So the day I got caught, back in 15, so I was on Metropolitan Avenue up in Queens. Oh, 2015. 2015, okay, I got, got caught. You. It was March, I'll never forget, it was March 3rd, 2015. Here we go. My shorty I was dating at the time, she was in the crib watching my daughter. And I literally told her, say, yo, I'll be back at go ham something. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even know. I was <laughs> this is crazy. The text was last the, night. The text. Uh, Check this shit out. The background. If it was to be a bank robber, or, or if it was a in the, bank, in the group chat, would we be in the process? bro, in the group chat, I was robbing banks my whole you life. Be, this was in the group chat. They even know, bro. Would be, I didn't know. Would you be a driver? The guy that goes in. I'm going in. The, uh, the guy that makes the plan. <laughs> I'm. A, I'll be the driver. I know I could get out of here. I'll be the planner. And <laughs> I'm going in. I'm going in. I'm going that in. Was the morning you got caught. The morning. I, this is March third, twenty fifteen. I literally said I'm going in. Okay. So this is the yeah. background. Be, this okay. was text last night. Okay. So you get it. So you, <laughs> the day before <laughs> mm -hmm. you robbed this bank, mm -hmm. they were just saying, if we were to rob a bank, yeah. who would we be and what would we do? Yes. That was the conversation in the group chat. Yes. The day before. The day before. The night before, March second. Okay. It came in the nighttime, and immediately I responded, "I'm going in." Yeah. I'm going in. Do, does anyone know what that means? I mean, if from what people seen from like the movies, the going in guy, you got the driver. Of course, there's always a. Oh, you're the guy that's going to be going in. I'm going in. Okay, got gotcha. you. Like, I'm enforcing. Like, this, okay. is, this is what needs to be okay, done. Okay, bring me to March 3rd. So, March 3rd. You're I'm not going. nervous? I'm not nervous, never. I've done this. A, you feel me? So, okay. I've done this quite a amount of time. So, I'm dolo now. I'm like, yeah, I need to go in and get this money. So, I go in the bank. This is where I knew it was spooky. It was raining. Uh, and it wasn't a Thursday. Thursday is the best time to rob a bank. Why? Um, deposit days, paydays. So they're gonna have more money in the draw. So that's when you go. Thursdays and Fridays, they keep more money in the draw. Okay. It was a Tuesday, it was raining, it was gloomy. So I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? But I was off work and I was bored. So I'm gonna go over and rob a bank. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I went to the bank. The one, two, uh, how I got caught Dolo, I was doing slips. I didn't have to brandish. You see the note, give me the fucking cash. Mm. But this one teller, it was a guy. Guys are always have some heroic sense, you feel me? I gave him the note, the nigga just stayed there and look at the note. <laughs> I don't have to talk. I had to talk to this nigga, like, yo, bro, hurry the fuck up before I start, you feel me? And of course, he, he moved faster, da 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 da. Were you armed? Of course. Mm. But. When you're armed and you feel something and that sense is happening, you gotta move fast so you can get rid of said pistol and keep it moving. So I'm in, 
I finally get the money. I get the fuck out. I brush past the bank manager. I remember the bank manager because I came and he asked, hey, do you need help? I said, nah, I'm good. <laughs> get the fuck out of my face. You have no like, idea where this is going. Like, bro, I know what I'm about to do. Get the fuck out right. of here. So I get the cash. I leave out. As soon as I leave, I hear the klaxons, the police sirens. I'm like, yeah, that's not good. How did they, that fast? The trick is this. When you're going into a bank, dot, dot, dot's about to happen. It could be any crime somebody shooting at cops, or I hear gunshots, and immediately, the cops gonna work there. Instantly, that's what they gonna do. They gotta right. go in and Drop serve. Right. Exactly. So, when I hear the, the sirens, I'm like, mm, that doesn't sound good. Because if somebody's getting held up, or you tell them the cops getting shot, they come in silent. Because they want to surprise whoever's doing said crime. Right, si sirens meant you got away. That's, no, sirens mean, for me, this shit is not gonna be good because the sirens you hear, it sounds like the conversion around you. So if your heart's always pounding fast, but now you hear the shit, you're like, oh, nah, I gotta get the fuck out of here. So I beeline the Metropolitan. You ever been to Metropolitan Avenue, Queens? Well, you don't have to give me the location. I give you the details and everything. I, <laughs> I'll show you my indictment and all that. It's all there, you feel me? I can trip it. Okay, I got you. It's literally there, yeah, exactly. So. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? There's about three precincts in the area, but shit is spooky. I hear everything. So I dip into the local Taco Bell, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I call my shorty. I said, listen, if anybody call you, don't pick up the phone from a weird number and don't let nobody in the house. She said, what? I said, if anybody call, don't, you know, Betsy, paranoid ass, don't pick up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Take my daughter back to my baby mother. She said, what? Take my big mother, my daughter back to my big mother, and I hung up the phone. So I'm in Taco Bell already. You know how you, I just had that feeling like, yeah, this is. So I'm sucking it up, sucking it up. I like, I'm ready, I know I'm gonna get caught eventually. I already ditched the gun on the side block a long time ago when I initially left Fox Ave, 67th Street. Mm -hmm. I already ditched it like on 69th, so I was good. So I'm back on Metropolitan Ave, trying to walk like a regular nigga now. Next thing you know, six cop cars. Converge, get down on the ground. Me, I'm like, the fuck is going on? This is where niggas is recording everything. So you got crackers recording, the blacks recording, like, what the fuck is going on? I'm like, I ain't do nothing. I don't know why they on me. Guns pointed on me and shit. I'm like, the get down on the ground. Get down on, he has a gun. Once that one cop said he has a gun, shit escalate. Now he's coming closer. I see the safeties clicks off. So all right, get on the ground, get on the ground. Now Say, you got it, you got yeah, it. Yeah, you got it. I'm on in the middle of the street. They literally told me get in the street. I forgot that part. So get in the street. I'm like, the fuck? I'm on the sidewalk. Get, I get on the street. Of course, nigga put the knee to the back. What he got? I'm like, what the fuck? I ain't got no gun. What the fuck is going on? And so uh, eventually, pick me up, they arrest me. These niggas high five. I'm like, we finally got you. We finally, what the fuck is going on? After I'm in the back seat, the niggas that got me, they high five and dapping up and say, we got him. He said, we finally got your dumb ass. What the fuck you talking about? He shows me wanted posters. Wanted posters, like, yeah, from Where? Staten Island, oh. Queens, Brooklyn, like. These are all the locations that you hit. Of course. So, yeah. And when, when you would go, in, it was that easy? It's literally that easy. You go in, here's the note, take the money. What was the biggest score? Uh, 84,000, Winsburg Saving Bank. What the fuck did you do with that money? I was 18 years old. I want a settlement. Damn near a million dollars. Like 889,000. Legit. Yeah. Uh, I put some away, of course, but um, money goes fast. When you have a lot of money, it literally goes fast. And nobody can you talk about the settlement? Me. What was it for? Uh, so the settlement, remember back in the day in Brooklyn, the chip paint? You just trying to say lead, 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 lead poisoning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My parents get, capitalized. I still get those um, yeah. things in the mail. My parents capitalized, and I won a settlement when I was uh, 12 years old. $889,000. You yourself? Me. It was mine. All of it. 889000 Yeah. What did you do? I mean, first thing first. Even back then, that's like... I was 18. First thing first, trips, clothes gear because i was so used to that lifestyle from doing crime like now it's amplified more now i can get even nicer shit even bigger diamonds my diamonds was twenty thousand dollars in my each ear you feel me 18 wow. years old you feel me so i went from 15k ears to twenty thousand dollars so now you know everything is elevated don't you need to go buy on a sweatsuits in high school now i can elevate to gucci sweatsuits you feel me now mm -hmm. i'm getting so it was a different kind of money so. and just blowing it yes. so how does like i, I just the transition from $889,000 to, all right, let me get this note. And how did you get into the note, writing notes to 
Yeah, this like, is what happened. Before I started the notes, I started back robbing bank. After I put money up and I had my daughter, I was like, oh, I got to slow down with this shit. So I put some money up. So now I'm working regular jobs. I'm in the culinary field. I work in a job, $12 an hour. I'm like, this ain't cutting it. Like, it's not cutting it. Like, rent's getting paid for and shit, but I can't buy this. I can't buy that. I can't do this. I can't do that. So yeah. I called my man. I'm like, he's like, all right, I got you. And back into robbing banks. But then they slowed off because two niggas got jammed up. So I was like, fuck, I'm doing myself. So. And then you go into, so they, 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 they sit you down. There's these wanted posters of you. Now they're like, we finally got you, you dumb ass. Yeah. And <laughs> so what's the charge that they hit you with? In the state. So it was the state that got me first. So I was in local, uh, with the local police department. And so they're talking, they're cheering, they're happy. So they're sending two detectives in. He's like, you hungry? I said, yeah, I'm hungry. I made them niggas order me pizza. <laughs> <laughs> I, ironically. I remember this. I made them niggas order me pizza. And they got me some pizza. I'm eating the pizza. So what you got to tell me? Literally, it was a black guy and a white woman. He said, what do you have to tell us? I said, I'm not telling y'all nothing. Eating the pizza. He said, you serious? I said, I don't have nothing to tell you. He's like, hold up. And they were gone for like 30 minutes. And they came back, so what you have to tell us? I said, he said, literally, you know where you live. I said, it's all my idea. Of course you know where I live. Like, I'm shit talking. I'm never really giving the cops nothing. It's like, so who else are you with? I'm like, literally, I'm by myself. They don't believe me, I'm by myself. Because this is what I learned from the cops. They said, we got you for 27 known and unknown bank robberies. I'm like, okay, I'm by myself. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. So I'm not giving them nothing. I ate half the pie, so they sent me back to my cell. And so a cop comes and say, yeah, we're letting you out. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? I said, yeah, come on, you're leaving. No cuffs or nothing, nigga take me out. I leave out the cell, it's the feds. I'm like, good, that's what I wanted. You, you, why? Less time. Mm. Less time with the feds, and in the state, when you do those kind of crimes in New York and it's the state, they're gonna hit you with more time. They just give you any time you want. Mm -hmm. There's no uh, mandatory minimum. Right. In the feds, there's mandatory minimum. Gotcha. So with my criminal history, mandatory minimum, I'm like, mm, yeah, I'm be good in the feds. Right, okay, what, what was your criminal history? Uh, when I was younger, um, I got caught with uh, two guns, but I used to take my guns apart. So you can't work an inoperable gun, so they can't charge you with that. So I beat New York State twice with inoperable guns. So, you feel me? <laughs> How long did you get when you, when you went For to? For feds, I got three and a half. I got 65 months. 65 months? Yeah. And all of the money that you acquired from these banks, <laughs> assuming you get to keep that money? This is what it is. So the trick is not to put too much money in accounts, because they will freeze everything. And if you got extravagant shit, the feds will take it, because they're going to say you pay for it with crime. So. And if you have a what? They're gonna, if you have a nice house, yep, nice cars, yep, 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 they're going to nice immediately house, think yep. it's crime, they're going to take it. I was working and working a good job, so they really couldn't do nothing because my pay stub showed like, yes, he making money. Then they get like, why are we robbing banks? Why not? Like, mm -hmm. that's where the money's at. Why would mm -hmm. I not rob the banks? Mm -hmm. So, you feel? What was your time in in jail like? What was that first night for you like? Federal for, in my prison or when I was in holding um, MDC. So before you go to your original jail, you're gonna be in holding MDC. Yeah. Literally, I was good. Mm -hmm. Old heads there, mm -hmm. homies there, everybody you know is in jail. Like, that's yeah. why it's weird. It's like, so yo, what you need? You need something? Yo, yo, make your call, call your shorty, have a send you money, mm -hmm. shit like that. So everything was really good. Even my whole bid. I came on the compound, niggas gave me a bag. He said, yo, make a call, I mean, get your shit together. Niggas gave you a cell phone. This is what prison was like here? In federal prison, yes. It was. So what about like the the, the gang tales and the so, the, the fighting and the you know, that's, so that's not a thing. This is <laughs> it is in federal prison. It is always a thing. It's politics all the time. But while you in prison, there's lows, there's mediums, there's maxims. And so I went to a low. With my criminal, I went to a low. So everybody's in the low. Is trying to get to a satellite camp. Trying to get to a camp. So there's no beef. There's really no wars until you get into the thick of it. There is little bullshit, but nobody's doing nothing. Everybody's trying to go home. It's either phones it's or K2s. Got you. That's the biggest issue. It's like, niggas don't really get poked up. Niggas ain't dying because niggas want to go home. Right. So word. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's funny. I hear, I hear that commonly, more common than not, that, that, you know, prison is bad, but it's like, you know, 
it's, it's manageable, especially if you're from the streets. It's mm -hmm. like you learn how to navigate different people, different personalities. Mm -hmm. um, what about your mental state? How's your mental state at this, in, in these moments at this time in your life? I literally remain the same person. It, it's hey, funny you person. say that because I get that from you. I re literally <laughs> remain the same person from when I was 10 to now. I'm literally remain the same person. It's I laugh like, and smile through everything. You said, what the fuck are you smiling for? I said, why the fuck not? You see me, I'm always smi I smile all the time. Even in prison. I had niggas in prison watching Chop with me and Food Network. Like, niggas, y'all gonna chill out. We go watch some Food Network. But it's almost like unconscious. Like, do you, like you're conscious. Do you, do you have one? Like, <laughs> this is the only thing is on my mind. Is there anything that tells you <laughs> maybe this is not a good idea or this is a really fucked up position. Robbing the banks or? Just overall in life. Do in have, life? Does that voice kick in? I live in the moment doing everything. My nickname is Rush. They used to call me Pop because that's how I, I move. That's how you got the name? Because I... This this what we doing. That makes sense. So that's why they yo rush, yo rush. Nah, I ain't doing that. So when niggas like, we ain't doing it, niggas be surprised when I say, nah, that's, let's not do that. Are you thinking? Like, nigga, I always think, but I don't want to do it. As fast as you make an impulsive decision is as fast as you can make a determining. Like, you know? yeah, I'm not doing it. That's a fact. If I don't want to do it, nigga, you're not making me do it. Was there ever a situation, was there anything in your life that you've done and you felt like, I rushed into this, maybe I should have willed it back, took my time? Or made a better decision? Woman, probably. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> probably with women, but and doing crime and running around, like, no, hell no. Like, you're not even thinking about nothing else. When you got something to do, and that's what I'm gonna do it, that's all you're thinking about. Like, I'm gonna do it. Like, it's crazy because, like, even in like a lot of the books that I read, like, th this, this philosophy is what they try to teach people to have. Like, this sort of, you know, laser focus, focus on the present, what it, what it is right in front of you. Mm -hmm. It's just you were using it to do, you use it to do everything. Literally everything, from crime, cooking, women, my child, I'm gonna use it to do everything. How does a person go from sticking up banks and transition to a master chef? <laughs> so I ran away to Colorado when I was 16. You ran away from home? Yeah. Okay. So something had went wrong on one of the jobs. And they say, yo, we got to get away. So I literally chose Colorado off a map. I chose Colorado. And when I got to Denver International, they had white vans to take you to the surrounding area. I chose Boulder because I like the name. Literally, I went to Boulder, Colorado because I like the name. That's where I was at. And you, you didn't tell your parents nothing? My mom knew. Uh, my, brother, my brother knew. And only one of my sisters knew. So you ran away to Colorado. And what did you do there? Um, while I was there, I was in Boulder for a while. I wasted my money, and then I found a plot. Yeah, you were rich at this time. No, I was 17. I oh. wasn't rich yet. Okay. I only had the money I had. Okay. So I had, um, I was in Boulder, I wasted my money, and then there was a, a place in Estes Park, Colorado called Eagle Rock. It's like an outward bound school where like the troubled youth go. So a bitch I was fucking with, an older bitch I was fucking with out there had to sign me up to Eagle Rock. And while I'm in Eagle Rock, um, I could have finished out my GED, but while I was in Eagle Rock, I learned carpentry and uh, like sewing, little shit like that, yeah. like labor skills. And then I uh, got to the kitchen and it was up from there. How did you find that love for sort of food? I sort of hear you talk about food and it's like you can you can talk for hours. Not literally, it. yeah. Uh, my grandma, Emma, she's from the South. She's been in the kitchen. My father. He used to be in the kitchen, and my mom, my mom traveled for school, so her love for food came from being overseas in, in France, and she passed that on to us. So once I got in that kitchen, the first dish that I had to make from being in the kitchen was my favorite food my mom used to make was chicken alfredo, so it was over from there. Once I see the reaction I got from people eating the food, like, oh, this is better than the chef make it, it was over. <laughs> so it, what, what kind of place does it put you in to sort of be in your, in your zone, in the kitchen, with your cutting boards and the flavors, the ingredients. Like, where does that put you? That's that rush element. That's where rush comes in. So a lot of people that know me, they call me rush in the kitchen. They get that. They see where I'm at, that euphoric feeling. While I'm in the kitchen and I'm doing my one-two, I tell everybody, get out the way. Like, I'm in charge. I'm running four stations. Like, y'all still over here. They see it like, oh, this nigga's in the groove. Mm. That's, that's how I feel. Like, you know, if I'm in the bank, now I feel that same feeling the, while I'm in the kitchen, while I'm in control, I'm handling everything. I'm dishing out the dishes, and all I have is my expo. One of my sous chefs on expo, make sure the dish come out right or putting it come together. So This rush is your high, and you sort of stay there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all the time. Yes. <laughs>
<laughs> you see where I'm going with this? <laughs> you know, what I'm like, you could be, at, at, at some point, you would want to maybe balance yourself mm -hmm. and find that center. You know, I know you said with women, sometimes you regret rushing mm -hmm. into it because yeah. it's sort of like maybe jams you up and of you, you're sitting there going back and forth with these, you know, so. So just applying sort of some kind of like a balance, like I'm sure like even with your mastery now mm -hmm. in the kitchen, mm -hmm. you know, talk to us a little bit of, about what you do now. So now I work for uh, I work for a company called it's a uh, high-end catering, fine dining, uh, some of the biggest venues uh, in the United States and in the Caribbean. So uh, I'm an executive chef. I oversee about 500 staff members and four executive chef, uh, sous chefs. So um, that's what I do. You feel me? I'm the I'm a I'm the guy they call for like photo ops. And when celebrity chefs comes, I cook for the celebrity chefs. That's that's my. <laughs> you are like the definition of like, if you put as much energy as you put into those games, you would be. <laughs> 4.0, you know what I mean? Like you, you, you sort of took your energy that you put into crime, mm -hmm. and then putting it into mm -hmm. the cooking and like, look at you, like. You remember? Uh, I sent y'all when I got my offer letter. I sent it to y'all. Y'all yeah, remember? Fingers. But that was for sous chef though, not executive chef. That was for the sous chef. Right. The executive chef came three weeks later, but um, I remember when I got the executive chef, I called my mom. It's, it's funny you said that. I literally told my mom, I said, Mom, remember you just tell me you stop playing all them games, you're wasting your time? Mm -hmm. I said, Your mom, they just made me the executive chef and they gave me X, Y, Z. She's like, Get the fuck out of here. I said, Mom, yes, they gave this nigga X, Y, Z. So, wow. word. Wow. You know, word. congratulations. Yes, I think sir. that is a, just an amazing, amazing feat. Mm -hmm. um, what was it like when you first held a gun? <laughs> I, t I just told you that story. This is hilarious. So I was 12 years old, and uh, we used to do shifts. I was living up in the Bronx. We used to do shifts up there. And so, of course, I was running the lake because I was like an idiot. And uh, my partner, he got robbed. Some niggas had robbed him at Eden Wall Projects up in the Bronx. And so we went to niggas, and niggas said, y'all better go get that shit back. We didn't have, they didn't give us no gun or nothing. So I went to my brother. My brother gave me a gun. He said, do what you got to do. I know who my brother is, I know what he meant. I was ready to kill some niggas for whatever it is we have to get. So at 12, we walking around, walking around, the sun's setting, this nigga's a bitch. He's like, man, we gotta go home. I mean, we gotta get our shit. So eventually we find these niggas. So immediately, I go up to the niggas, I said, y'all robbed my homie, we need a shit. Of course, niggas proceeded to give us our shit back. I seen the power with a gun, how fast they move, so I took it a step further. I want everything, so I'm taking these niggas' wallets, I'm taking their money, and I'm taking their jewelry, fuck it. So we take everything, and then um, from there it was over. I didn't want to leave the pistol ever. Like, mm. 12 years old, it's like, literally, you can make anybody do anything. Like, life or death, like, niggas is gonna move, they're gonna jump. Like, nigga, give me this now. So, yeah. Do you still operate with these same tactics? Always. Still? Always. Always. Even with your life? Even in the, if, we, if, I, if I'm on a meeting and I'm on a call, this is my, yo, that's not gonna work. No, this is gonna work because I'm telling you it's gonna work and you're gonna do it. I'm talking to whites like this, like, listen, I'm your boss. You don't listen to me, I find somebody else that's gonna listen to me and do it. But without the gun? Without the gun. Okay. But see, they, my company knows my background. So they know, I will, I will, if I have to, I will, you know, I won't, but white's a fucking pussy. <laughs> if I talk to you, if I'm telling you to do something, you going against me, if it fails, you were right. But if I'm telling you to do something and it works, get the shit done. Like Another quote um, that I would always hear growing up was, there's always someone bigger and better than you. What happens when you run into that guy? I'm sure you've met that guy before, whoever he may be. I got two people that's bigger than me in my company. The CEO and the culinary director. We see we see eye to eye. For one, I'm making the company loads of money. Y'all can use me for photo ops, and it's good for y'all to have a felon on your books that's just talented, who's black, because you know companies are going for inclusion, diversity inclusion now. So now they say, oh, he's the way he is, the way he handles products, and he knows his numbers. You can be a great chef, but to be an executive chef, to be a standout, you have to know your numbers. Labor costs, food costs. 
P and Ls. You got to be on top of those things. DSR reports. If you don't know those things, nobody's going to hire you to be executive chef because you have to know your numbers. So the fact that I know these numbers without school, they're like, all right, yeah, he, he knows his shit. We need him. We got to keep him around. And the staff respect him. Yeah. You can't have a leader there or a boss that's there and the staff don't respect him. It's not going to show in the food and the quality. How about someone that was bigger and better than you in the street? In the street? The street is always different. You always got to answer to somebody. And you can't just act just to act. There's always somebody that you have to answer to. So if you say I've had beef with a nigga, it has to pass the chain of command. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to go get this nigga. That's why these little niggas got it wrong now. You have to ask for approval before you take that next step, even if you're fighting a nigga. Because who knows if he's doing dealings with said guy or X, Y, Z. So. What's the, what's the worst that's gotten for you in the streets? Probably when I was younger, uptown, living them damn Jamaicans. Uh, it wasn't nothing against me as the way they used to talk to my sister and her friends. So, um, sister came in the house, niggas was licking up, me and my boys was licking up, and they said, oh yeah, they called us bitches. You know, now niggas, in our heads we think, oh, now we gotta do something. Niggas said, we just gonna fight them. No, I had an AK, I went up the block and shot the block up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I went up the block and shot that shit up. Was it AK-47? Young as hell, AK-47, shot the block up. <laughs> how, how do you even get an AK-47? Money talks. You can literally get anything with money. Anything. An AK-47, I'm sure you hit somebody. Four. They had four people. I was afraid to ask. Like, did they die? Nah. When I was younger, I was always taught aim below the waist. Old heads, nobody wants to get murdered, but yeah, it's on the way, so yeah. And the AK is crazy, that shit jumped like a mother. So you gotta try your hardest to keep that shit down. Because it. Yeah. I don't even have to ask you what do you see yourself doing if you wasn't, you know, robbing banks, um, because we, we can see the quality of your work now. Um, do you ever get the urge to go back in for the fast cash? I'm not going to lie, yes. Yes. There's, I have a safe on some on some uh, restaurant sites, there's safes. I go in the safe, I'm like, it'd be so easy to take this shit. Like, it'd be so easy, to, but, you know. What stops you? The money they're paying me. Mm -hmm. The bonuses I get, you feel mm -hmm. me? Why would I risk that when I'm getting, so. What was school like for you? My sisters, I got uh, five sisters, I got three brothers. I'm the youngest boy, so. Large family. We had large family, cousins and all that. So growing up, I felt like going to school, we were so smart, I felt like I didn't need school. And so, and I was in ninth grade, I was like, mm. in 10th grade, I was like, I'm just not going, I stopped going. I didn't, I felt like I didn't need it. Everything else teaching me, I felt like I knew already. And your, your family, were they, were they sort of like very frustrated with you growing up or just like, you know what, that's just... I wasn't in their house. I was living on my own, so I wasn't living with my mom. I was gone. Where you live? I was uh, staying up in the Bronx with my boy. We had literally bought a house. Young as hell, bought a house. And yeah, that's where he was living. From the streets? Mm-hmm. Selling drugs, robberies, mm -hmm. whatever it took. Mm -hmm. I was giving my mom for rent, money for my sister so they can go shopping. So like... Do you have any regrets? None. Not one. It's who I am now. I can't be, that shit made me who I am. Like, I'm not, no regrets. No regrets. Literally none. It is what it is, but none. Um, is karma something that you think about or that's prevalent? I probably would have got it already by then. That's why I don't really believe in karma. Don't make fun of that kid. Your kid gonna come out ugly. My daughter's beautiful. So I'm like, karma gotta be bullshit. I made fun of every kid still to this day. Or you gonna end up crippled. You know, them crippled kids. I used to make fun of them. I don't believe that stuff. <laughs> well, I think I think karma is is more to do with. It, it doesn't have to be like that deliberate. Like, okay, because you caught a kid ugly, you know, your kid is gonna be ugly. You know what I mean? But just sort of like a universal law that like you gotta kind of like have a moral code and just treat people right and. That's, Just so that good things can happen for you. And that's my moral code. I employ only blacks. If they felons, they're top on my list. I'm actually right. starting a felon program with my job. They're implementing a program in September. 
So felons, any felons that come out of prison, they're going to get jobs. I actually opened up a whole new restaurant. It's going to be just felons, and I'm going to be in charge of that. So you feel me? What did your job say when they found out that you were filming? Were you upfront about it, or was this like They knew with the background check. They did the background and check. They talked to me. I had three people from HR call me and said, listen, we know you're this, but I had a guy in there. I loved him. He vouched for me. He said, yes, he did this, but this is what he done since he came out of prison. Wow. I'm two years removed from prison. He said, look at his resume. Wow. And so they took that leap, and it's the best thing they ever done in a long time. So. <laughs> <laughs> They got me running a resort in, in Bermuda this summer, bro. Wow. I'm, so. What's something that you would tell someone that sort of feels like they've thrown their life away to crime or prison, and they kind of, you know, want to get a career one day, but they feel like the world is, because I, I think something about your story that's like not really overstated is, is like you work hard. Not literally, you have to put in the work. You, you know, really hard. Literally, I was working before I got to where I'm at now, three, four, literally sometimes five jobs. They're like, how you doing that? It's restaurant work. I can work at 40 restaurants if I want to, but I'm going to keep working and working and grinding and grinding. New York City is so massive, but the restaurant world is so small. Yo, send that chef over. Yo, send that chef. Yo, no, not him. Send him over. People actually start looking for you because they remember your food. Like other chefs that eat the food, like who the fuck made that? Yeah, yeah, have them come here. They want you to work in their restaurant. They work in their restaurant. Everything is worried about from New York City and the culinary field. So if you that nigga and you busting your ass, they see your hard work, but they're tasting the food and how good it is, they're going to call you. People literally call and looking for you. So wow. you got to put in the work. You got to put in the work. can't be, oh, I'm a chef. Yeah, I know there's millions of chefs in New York, but what makes you different? What makes you different? Show us. Show me. What you can say you it, but show me. Well, what makes you different? Oh, me? The grind, the work, the realness. I can't be phony. Even in front of the camera, you'll see some of the videos coming up. I just can't be phony. And they love that about me. They say, listen, just don't cuss. That's a lie. Same way I talk to y'all. Same way I talk to these whites in board meetings. Just be real. Be real. Smile all the time. You know, be authentic, you know. But your food has to it has to meet that quality. You can be that guy, but is the food like that? This is Trevor Anonymous. My name is Chris Stabs. Let's get it. How many banks did you hit? I had three banks in February. I know that last one was 49000 for All-Star Weekend, and I was sick because I wanted to enjoy my birthday. You feel me? <laughs> you feel me? So <laughs> we did not know where that money was coming from. It was all cash. Cash. Like cash. Bands. I got you, I got you, I got you. <laughs> no, no, don't worry about it. <laughs> I wish I, I, I could live that freely. <laughs> I feel like you're just so free, you know. I'd be thinking, overthinking it too much, you know. Even you sometimes, yeah, I'd just be, I'd, I'd be in my own head. I'm good now. But, like, that, but that was, but that wasn't, you did three that month, but you, that was probably like your six overall, right? No, no, no. in November the month, the year before. So, I was charged with six, but my first indictment was 27 known and unknown. They had to prove those. They couldn't, so they had to switch the indictment. And I was, you feel me? <laughs> you feel me? So, <laughs> so yeah. We're not gonna specify. Yeah, so as long, listen, as long as I was having a good time, my daughter's school was paid for, she was healthy, my baby mama was good, my rent was paid, I didn't care. I wouldn't have believed it if I didn't see your face in the paper. Nobody, no, literally my boys called me, I was out of jail. Nigga said, yo, nigga said, yo, why you didn't tell me? I said, why would I tell you, bro? Why would I tell anybody I'm robbing? It's like, I can't, I'm happy with you a split to take, nigga. This is mine, bro. Like, it's, it's, but you had no shame. No. And, and, and your mother never, never worried about what mama might say? I never had a, see, me and my mom relationship ain't that good. Mm. So I never really had that. Even when I was hustling, and I'm giving my mom money, my mom never would ask, like, oh, where you get the money from? Like, so why, what, what do you mean your, your relationship wasn't that good? Like, what, what happened? I was in foster care. I grew up in foster care and shit. I, became, I was always independent. Before all my siblings, I was just more independent than them. Like, I was gone. I didn't, I didn't rely on my mom. Like, people like, mom, I need to get, I never relied on my mom. Like, Were you always in foster care? Was your, all, your, all your brothers and sisters? Uh, I got older from my father's side. They're older. Three of my, uh, two of my brothers and one of my sisters. So I got six siblings. And so... We went to foster care when I was four first. My grandma took us in. 
And then we was out, we was back out of foster care with my mom again. Then we went out of foster care. Then our aunt took us in. We are seeing my aunt and shit, so. We went back to my mom when I was about 12 or 13, but by then I was gone. Did you sort of resent her for that? Nah, no resentment. It's all love. You know, I still call my mom. When done, the only thing I probably do resent her for is that she didn't reach out to um, my big mother when I was in prison. But besides that, I mean, it is what it is. Y'all speak till this day? She, we text each other. How about your dad? Eh, he's another nigga. Fuck him. I don't really, you know. The only time I really talk to him, holidays, hit me up. I hit him up, but I don't care. Hmm. I just really don't care. It's, I have a daughter like to worry about. I don't got to worry about it. it is what it is. As a kid growing up with, with sort of that looming over you, you know what I mean? Did that... Did, did you ever find yourself, like, really, like, angry about that, or? No. You just my, always was just, like, so. You see this? This is real. My mm -hmm. sisters, my cousins, my family, auntie, friends, always had love around me, always. So mm -hmm. I never really even second thought, like, damn, why my mom didn't know? For what? Love for my aunties, family, my sisters. My sisters, she raised us, so. I never, not one time, they're like, fuck, damn, why mommy don't? I wrote them a letter when I was in prison. They both didn't respond because I tear in their ass, but it is what it is. I literally wrote my mom a 26-page letter, front and back, front and back. She didn't respond. It is what it is. Say what? Everything. I told her everything, how my life was. Shit my mom never knew. I told her everything. Literally everything's in that letter. I promise you she still got it. She didn't respond. It is what it is. You ever spoke to her about that? No. Nah. And I don't care to. I don't care to. Because then it's... Now, like, damn, now I gotta feel some kind of way, or my mom probably, she probably felt guilty because how she was as a parent, but, no, nah, I'm not stressing that. I can't. I can't be, mm -mm. Then, nigga, but what's the matter? At, at work, are you good? Like, I'm good. Last thing on my mom is, on my mind is, what my mom think, or my father think about what I'm doing. They congratulated me when they found out I got this big job, mm. and I got this promotion. They're mm. happy for me, you know, because I'm still their son, but it was a congratulation, like, you'll give a colleague. That's how I took it. Cause I don't, I don't care about them that, in that regard, truthfully. Wow. I mean, you know, still mom and dad. Yes, but no. Yeah. You know, those are the parents we have. That's not the ones I chose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it is what it is. Oh man, I mean, so so much. So much of who we are and what we are comes from our inception. So much of how we are, the way we are, comes from our upbringing. Mm -hmm. So it's just like you living with that for so long and maybe sort of suppressing those, those emotions just so you could go to work, just mm -hmm. so you could take care of your child, just mm -hmm. so you could take care of your home. You know, you got to kind of just keep like, you know what? that's not gonna help me right now, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, I respect it. Mm -hmm. I respect it, you know. Um, I think that there comes a time where it always comes out. And that's what I'm usually like most fearful of. Like sometimes you'll just be chilling there. You'll, you'll hear a song or something, you just burst out crying, you know what I mean? You don't even know why, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Or you, somebody say something to you, you get just so angry, and you don't know why you feel that anger. Like, what is like, what is this? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And just like so much stuff that we didn't address, yeah. or so much stuff we got bottled up, and mm -hmm. we got to keep going, keep going. Especially as men, we got to keep going, keep taking care, keep taking care, keep taking care. Don't matter, don't matter, don't matter, mm -hmm. until we crash and burn. It's like I don't feel like it should be like that. You feel what I'm saying? You right. I'm in therapy. I go once a week. Fine. Uh, it's online, it's, it's virtual. I go once a week. Um, it, it helps just to talk it out, but yeah. that's literally the last thing on my mind. Oh, and I gotta hear this all the time from other relatives, you're just like your father. Wow. And they're 100% right. Wow. Like genetics is crazy, just like him. You look just like him and everything. You're just not tall like him, but. Yeah. I always say like, that the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, mm -hmm. but it's up to us to sort of determine the tree that grows from us. Mm. Like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, we, we can't control the tree we came from, but we could, we could control the tree that we grow. You know what I mean? And who we are and how we administer to our own and sort of try to, you know, change. You know, so once you can 
you, we can't control a lot. Can't. But I can control this right here. So right. you know we just we give our best, man. I really appreciate you opening up and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know me, I'm like man. <laughs> you put me off for long <laughs> enough, man. But you know, I think it was the reason we, 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 we met, we sat down and we got to get to these stories. I'm sure that a lot of people is gonna, you know, really benefit from hearing your your story, your voice and you know. Maybe maybe we'll be back here one day. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> Yo, this is Chapman Anonymous. My name is Chris Styles. Peace. Yes, sir. Let's get it. And here's a scene from our next episode of Trapping Anonymous, where our guest details bringing his girlfriend to a sex club. So say we joined in, right? So say we joined in. You giving me head. And a guy comes behind you. What are you going to do? So, you know, she rebuttaled it very well. What'd she say? She said, <laughs> she said, the question is, what are you going to do? <laughs> Yo. 